Welcome back to Flatirons Tuning. For this episode, this is going to be, uh, let's call it video number two, about our updates to the dry sump oiling system uh, to correct some of the issues that we had last year. Uh, for all the details as far as like the specific problems we were having, uh, head back and check out one of the video. But now we've got the car pretty well back together. We're just chasing one small fueling issue. Uh, discovered that our, our fuel cell <clears throat> was getting towards the end of its design life, so they recommended uh, replacing the bladder in there, so we're, we're about to get that put back together so we can finally fire the car up and, uh, and get to testing this new solution. Before I dive into uh, all the details of what we've done, just want to say, um, you know, if you like this channel, if you like the content that we're putting out, please do like and subscribe to the channel. That helps us out a ton, uh, helps the channel grow, and helps more people find the channel. And the other thing I just want to say is this video, as always, is brought to you by Flatirons Tuning. Uh, the very best way to support this channel, help ensure that we can keep coming back and making this content for you, is to go to our website, which is flatironstuning.com. If we have anything at all that you might need there, uh, that support goes a long, long way to letting us keep coming back and making these videos for you. So um, thanks very much for your support, as always, and uh, check out Flatirons Tuning. Uh, we would greatly appreciate it. Okay, so. Uh, before I dive into the specifics of the fixes that we did, I want to touch on a question that we get somewhat often because of all the uh, videos that we made on air oil separators and catch cans over the years. And the question is, why didn't Subaru put an air oil, separ an air oil separator on the car to begin with? And it's a trick question in some ways because Subaru actually did. Um, it's easy to overlook, but there is an air oil, an air oil separator on these engines from the factory. It is that, that back cover plate um, and uh, that's why you don't have a lot of PCV and oiling issues at the stock power levels driven on the street for the most part. Those issues start to come up as power is increased and as you start driving on the track and, and having more, more side loads and such. That's where the aftermarket air oil separators come in, which basically sit on top of the factory air oil separator and are a larger volume. So it kind of takes the, the factor error oil separator when it's failed and increases the volume to give you a, a greater capacity for which you know for most applications it works. But when these when the error separator starts system starts to break down or the PCB system starts to break down, it's virtually always related to issues to do with the crankcase pressure building up. And one of the biggest reasons, well, the, the main reason we put a dry sump on this car is because we wanted just rock steady oil pressure going into the engine. You wanted to know that no matter what you know the condition, uh, what conditions the car was seeing as far as braking, acceleration, turning, G loads, what have you, that there was always consistent and reliable oil pressure going into the engine for engine reliability. But the second part of that was to remove all of these potential issues that can crop up with the PCV system or an air oil separator, etc., to make the engine more reliable. Because with the with the dry sump system, since you have these scavenge pumps that are pulling all that oil and gas from the crankcase and sending it out to a tank, you know, that should eliminate any of these potential issues. What we kind of failed to, to fully understand or fully comprehend at the time when we were putting this on the first go was that because you're sending all of that gas into the oil tank, you have to still contend with the gas volume that builds up in the tank. And that that is that is the piece of the puzzle that we missed. Um, you know, we we, we had kind of the worst case scenario last year when we were doing all of this initially because we had that engine failure right as we started to test the car. Um, that was due to a coolant hose that dropped all of our coolant basically immediately that caused a catastrophic failure. So any of the time that we would have had from that first testing weekend until race week was spent pulling the engine out and scrambling to get the car running again versus being able to fine tune and test our, our configuration. So after the issues that we had last year, we worked a lot with Roger Clark and they really basically have pointed us in, in the direction that we are now um, with, as far as fixing all the plumbing issues that we had. So that hopefully now we can get that reliable behavior out of the dry sump that we were looking for last time. So as you can see now, the air oil separator is gone. In fact, the entire PCB system is gone and the crankcase is now sealed up with one exception. And that one exception, you can see here, it's this gold hose. The key piece of the puzzle that we missed is that we were keeping the crankcase and the oil tank basically separate except for the, the uh, send and return from the oil pump itself. 
Roger Clark let us know is we needed a connection between the two. We needed a hose that connected the crankcase to the oil tank. And with that, that's what should hopefully give us a, a much better performance and, and really help to solve this problem. We kind of caused the problem in a certain, to a certain extent, or at least I'm pretty sure we did, with uh, leaving the air oil separator on last year with a filter. So the, the rationale behind it, again, was to prevent too much crankcase vacuum from forming. And at the time, without having our vacuum check valve, that probably was the best starting point that we could have had. But having that open filter meant that those scavenge pumps, which are pretty efficient, could send as much air as they wanted with that oil return back to the tank. And that's, I believe, what to a large extent caused the problems that we were having with the overflow of the tank. We're, we are seeing too much air and allowing the oil to get frothed up too much because of all that air on the return path to the tank. And that's where we just didn't have the capacity to basically let that, let that froth dis dissipate and let that pressure dissipate before we had to you know, pull the oil back in. So this connection between the two, between the tank and the crankcase, should balance that out. So now that, that the crankcase is fully sealed, if we were to start building up any kind of a vacuum, this hose is going to allow those scavenge pumps to now pull gases and, and oil vapor from the tank back into the crankcase, very similar to kind of what the factory air oil separator configuration is. That should allow the crankcase and the oil tank to basically reach some kind of pressure equilibrium. Um, there, we still, still do have a little bit of a concern that this hose might not be large enough to allow a full equilibrium, and to an extent we do want a slight amount of vacuum to develop in the crankcase. But uh, if, if we start to see an issue, any issue with that, now we do have our vacuum check valve. So if we, if we need it now, we can put this in place to really control the, the crankcase environment, but also balance out the oil tank and uh, pressure environment as well. So once those things are in equilibrium, there should be a dramatically, uh, dramatic reduction in the amount of gases that have to dissipate um, from basically the oil tank. So we shouldn't be overloading our, our auxiliary tank uh, like we were before. So that is, that is, this connection is the key piece of the puzzle that we were missing more than anything um, from last year's run. It is also worth mentioning, it's, a, it's a, kind of a smaller detail, but the other thing Roger Clark strongly encourages us to do is to put on an oil cooler. So we've done that as well. We've got an oil cooler down here, and we weren't really concerned about oil temperatures because of the volume of oil that we're, we're running in the tank and because it's placed in the, in the car versus in the engine bay, it's in a cooler environment. But you know, they really recommend putting a cooler in place, so we've done that too, just to really kind of help keep uh, oil temperatures in check, keep that oil temperature where we want it to be. And, and that should also give us more reliable performance this year as well. So um, that is where we are right now. So again, we just, we just have to finish up that fueling issue and then we'll be able to start this car up and start shaking it down. So the last installment of this will hopefully be me coming back after we've got the cartoon and been to the track for at least a day to give, it, give you our final results to this point. But hopefully they're going to be positive this time. And hopefully now we've got the dry sump sorted to the point where we can you know, run the car for 20, 30, 60 minutes before we have to even give the oil level in the tank in consideration. So that is the goal, is, is to keep the car as reliable as possible and, and let it just, you know, put, put gas in and drive. That is, that is our goal. Uh, we don't want to have to give it a whole lot of uh, maintenance and attention just, uh, you know, for every, you know, every time we run the car. So, so that's where we're at. Um, We'll end it there for now, and I will just say, you know, until next time, thanks so much for watching. We really do appreciate your support, and uh, as always, stay tuned with Flatirons Tuning.